But this morning, uh, you're stuck with me. Sorry. So if you have your Bible, turn to Psalm 107. That's where we were last week. We're going to pick back up where we left off. Um, so if you have your little note sheet that you took last week, sorry, we're not gonna, I'm not going to do that. I'm, my, my message is a little bit different than the way Tony had it laid out. We're different people, so that makes sense, right? So um, sorry, if you like to fill out the little paper, um, you're going to have to make your own DIY today. So um, but let's pray, and then we'll jump into Psalm 107. Lord, we come before you this morning. God, we just we call upon you. We need you to speak to us. Lord, I have nothing, nothing good to share. My opinions don't matter. Uh, but, but Lord, we know that your word is what, is what we need to hear today. So I pray that you would move me out of the way, that I would allow your spirit to speak, and that we would be receptive of what you're showing us. Lord, uh, because if, if we're not going to, if we're not going to stand under or understand what you're showing us, there's no point in us even being here. So Lord, I pray that we would apply what you're showing us and God, that you'd give us a heart to, uh, as we're going to look at today to share our story. Lord, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay. So last week we were in Psalm 107 and we looked at two types of people. We looked at the wanderer and we looked at the prisoner. And so here's just a little recap of the wanderer. This was someone who spends their life wandering from place to place, from thing to thing. They long for community, but, they all, but they're always looking for a place to fit in. Even in the midst of community, they don't feel like they have a place, right? They're always craving that community, but then they, they feel alone in the community. Right, uh, They crave attention and acceptance, always wanting more. And this person will only find satisfaction in the Lord Jesus Christ. That will, that's the conclusion that we came to is the only satisfaction for the wanderer is salvation, satisfaction in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so salvation is the solution to the wanderer. That's where they're going to find a place to belong. They belong in the family of God. Right? They, don't, they don't have to wander in God's family. Okay, so then we looked at the prisoner. And the prisoner is someone who is, who is in physical or mental bondage, sometimes both. They spend their life going nowhere. They're bound by depression and addiction. And again, I think those two are tied hand in hand. A lot of times it's depression and addiction. Okay, they will remain in bondage until they realize that Jesus Christ is the only freedom that they're going to find. Salvation is the solution for the prisoner to have their chains fall off, right? And so that's what we looked at last week. Um, and, and in a way, Tony was, you know, making references. He, he feels like the wanderer, and, and, and that's, that describes him. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, man, I'm both of those. I've been a wanderer. I've been a prisoner, sometimes at the same time. And then today, we're going to look at two more types of people found in Psalm 107. And that's the fool and the achiever. And again, these both describe me. Uh, I feel like, I feel like I'm, I'm the biggest screw-up in the world. I, I got, all four of them are, apply to me in some way, shape, or form. And so maybe, maybe today, maybe you, weren't, you can't identify with the wanderer, and you can't identify with someone who's in who's in prison in the sense of you're in bondage to yourself. You're in bondage to your sin. But today, I, I pray that you could relate to the fool or the achiever. And so um, let's, let's look at this. Psalm 107, verse 17. We're going to look at the fool. And this is someone who makes foolish decisions, right? The fool is, is found in Psalm 107, 17. It says, fools, because of their transgression... And because of their iniquities are afflicted, their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them, and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. 
And so we're going to break these two down in, into problem, and then, and then there's the solution, and then there's the result. So let's look at the problem of the fool. The problem is found in the first two verses. Let's, let's read those again. I know we just read it, but just so that we're fresh on what we're talking about. This is the problem of the fool. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities are afflicted, their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. And so these people, they can't get out of their own way. Their, issue, their issues are self-inflicted. Right, So they, they're the kind of people that they're stumbling over their own mistakes. Um, and again, I, this is me. I can relate to the fool. I, I'm, I am a, a, the definition of a fool. I, I get in my own way all the time. And Galatians 6, 7, and 8 tell us this. Be not deceived. God is not, not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh, shall of the flesh... Receive, reap, reap corruption, but he that soweth of the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And so, if you're if you are sowing seeds, if you're sowing an apple seed, you're, you're gonna you're gonna get an apple, right? That's that's the way it works. And so, this in this passage, he's saying if you're if you're sowing unto the flesh, all you're doing is is you're you're, you're planting seeds that are fleshly. You can be guaranteed that, that the fruit of that is going to be fleshly. But if you're sowing to the Spirit, you're planting eternal seeds, you're, you're going you're gonna, to, the fruit of that is going to be the Spirit, spiritual things. And so you reap what you sow. And the fool is always, is, they're always sowing bad seeds. They're, they're planting foolish things, Right? And so they spend their whole life hurting themselves with foolish decisions, making poor choices. They f and then they fall into a sin that is all-consuming. They, they get so deep in the mire of sin that they begin to despise food and even life itself. That's what we see in verse 20. It says, "...their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gate of death. They have no desire to eat anymore." They're so sick to their stomach with the choices they're making. They lose all desire to eat. They have no desire to live anymore. These people find themselves with no purpose or motivation in life. Their hearts have grown calloused. They're desperate just to feel something. And, they often, and this often manifests itself through eating disorders. It manifests itself through self-harm or, or even suicide. And so let's make a quick practical side note here. Because when we're dealing with food, there's, there's a thing that we got to understand. Um, that, that's a direct, there's a direct parallel to the Word of God. And so here's, here's some profound wisdom. Not so profound, but I'll share it anyways. If you don't eat, you're going to die. I don't know if you knew that. If I don't eat for a couple hours, I feel like I'm going to die. You know what I'm talking about? But if you have no desire to eat and you, and you choose to, to just stop eating, you don't care anymore, eventually, eventually you're going to perish. This person has no desire to eat. They draw near unto the gates of death. They don't even care if they live anymore. Now, so what, what's the spiritual implication of, of not eating? Well, if you do not spend time feasting on the word of God, you will spiritually draw near to the gates of death. Just a fact. The word of God is often equated to food in the Bible. So if, as you read through the Bible, time and time again, it, it's, it's equated with food. It's equated to, to the sweetness of the honey. It's, it's our daily, it's a portion. It's exactly what we need. So spending time with the Lord in his word is like sitting around the table with your loved ones. Man, what, what happens when you're, when you're around the table at Thanksgiving? I mean, if you love your family, if you got, if you got a family that can get along, man, it's a sweet time. Um, I have one side of the family that gets along well. One side that not so, not so well, right? But whenever, whenever I'm sitting around with my loved ones, Enjoying some food, man, it's, it's refreshing. 
It's nourishing to the soul. But spiritually speaking, when we sit at the table of the Lord, we leave feeling satisfied and renewed. And so if, if we're not feasting at the table of the Lord in his word, we're going to draw near to the gates of death spiritually. And that's what's happened here with the fool. Matthew 4.4, 4, it says this, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Go ahead and turn to 1 Peter 2, too. You guys are getting, uh, you're getting spoiled. I'm just reading all these off for you, and you're not having to turn pages. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you turn your Bible once or twice today. Go to 1 Peter 2, too. Jesus tells us that man shall not live by bread alone. Food is not the only thing that we need to survive and thrive in this life. It may feel like it, but I'm telling you, the word of God is, is, is what's really going to get us where we, where we need to be. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, it says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you grow thereby. So if we want to grow spiritually, just like if I want to grow physically, my children are in the, in the process of growing every day. Like they're growing more and more and more. And the, and the way that they grow is by proper nutrition. We feed them food, their body processes it, and it, it turns into upward motion, right? And so spiritually speaking, if we want to grow, you can't expect to grow when you're malnourished spiritually. It's just not going to happen. Because, again, we have to feast at the table of the Lord if we want to see ourselves spiritually grow. And a lot of times, these people that we're describing here, they're, they're prone to make foolish decisions. And so they, they want so desperately, and maybe, maybe they don't even know the Lord, but maybe they do know the Lord. They want so desperately to get close to God, but, but they won't open the, the word of God and spend time with them. And so foolishness continues to manifest itself in their life because they don't have the wisdom of the word of God. The Bible tells us in Psalm 119 that the wisdom that's found in the word of God, verse 97 in that area, I'll just read it up because it's, I love this passage. I, I just can't seem to get away from it. Every time I'm speaking, the Lord brings it to my mind. It says, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thou, through thy commandments, hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I have thy precepts. So he, he says, because your word is my meditation all the day, I love it. It has made me wiser than mine enemies. I have more understanding than my teachers, more understanding than the ancients. He's able to have an eternal perspective. And we have to have the wisdom of the Lord to make right decisions, to grow spiritually. It's, it's imperative. All right. Um, Jeremiah 15, 16 says this, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. Jeremiah eats the word of God. He consumes it. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Naturally, we get the same idea in the text here at hand. So we, we, we can go all over the, the, the world in the Bible, physically, spiritually speaking. We can go all over the Bible and find references to how the word of God is necessary. It's like food. We need it. But the, the context of the passage itself tells us this. Look at verse 20, Psalm 107, verse 20. It says, he sent his word and healed them. Well, these foolish, the fool, man, they, they, they're not making right choices. What does he do to heal them? He sends his word and delivered them from their destruction. The word of God is a solution to our, fool, to our foolish hearts. They did not need physical healing. It was a spiritual issue. They went from, physically mal from being physically malnourished, they had no desire for food, to being spiritually full. And so 
that's the spiritual implication of the passage. We, we need God's word. It's very important. So that was the problem with the foolish person. Okay? They make foolish decisions uh, to the point of not even caring anymore. Well, what's the solution? What's the solution for them? We, we already discussed the word of God. These people, uh, they may try to pay for their sin through abusing themselves. But the truth of the matter is the only hope for this person is to cry unto the Lord for salvation. You cannot earn your way to God through self-defeating means. God's not interested in you punishing yourself for your sin. Despite what any other religion teaches you, God is not interested in you abusing yourself for your sin. How do, how do I know that? Because punishing yourself for your sin isn't necessary. We've got to trust in the stripes of Jesus Christ for our salvation. The wrath of God was poured out for your sin, but it wasn't on you. Praise God for that. It was poured out on his son. He was punished for your sin. He took our rightful place on the cross, and he took the punishment on our behalf. Isaiah 53, 5. This morning as we were praying over the... Go ahead and turn there, Isaiah 53, 5. As we were praying over the service this morning, uh, David Williams made mention that he had been reading over this, this passage. And uh, it's no coincidence that the Lord had it for us today. Isaiah 53, 5. This is, this is some great news. He tells us this, Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Who are we talking about? That's Jesus Christ, Right? He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. You're not, you're not saved by your own stripes. Stop beating yourself up. Stop trying to punish yourself. There's nothing that you can do to be accepted in the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the eyes of God, other than to accept Jesus Christ. That's all. It's real simple. All right, go back to Psalm 107, verse 19. This is the solution. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth, he saveth them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Again, just as we've already seen, the word of God must become the source of nutrition. It brings, it, it, it gives us the ability to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation. It brings about healing and deliverance. And so we, we got to ask this, ourselves the question, why the word of God? If I haven't already made the case for the word of God, why? Here's a few biblical byproducts of what God does through his word in your life. The word of God produces faith in the hearer. So while, while I'm reading this, or maybe turn to John 15. I'll, I'll actually wait. Go, to, go ahead and go to John 15. I've got another passage for you to look at. But the first thing we're going to look at is God. The word of God produces faith in the hearer. And if you're a student in my youth group, you've heard this many times. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I'm a, I'm a big advocate for trying to open the word of God with your friends. Okay, you don't have to be you don't have to be perfect at sharing the Bible with somebody. You just read it. Okay? Sometimes we can get we can get a little uh, nervous about saying the right thing when it comes to sharing the gospel, but if we can get the word of God open with our friends, that's a big thrust for us as as a youth group. Man, faith comes by hearing. And hearing comes by the word of God. So God produces faith in the hearer of his word. That's something that is a supernatural thing that I can't do. I can't produce faith. I can't argue faith into somebody. How many times have you argued with somebody about your, your, your spiritual views and then been like, yeah, I get it. I want that. No, you just make people even more upset. So we, we want to get the word of God into the souls of men. That's why we hide the word of God in our heart, so we can share it, even if we don't have our Bible handy. Okay, the word of God, that the first thing is it produces faith in the hearer. The second thing is the word of God purifies and it prunes us. So John 15, let's look at this passage. It's another one of my favorite passages. 
And it's talking about how um, it, God is divine and we're like Jesus is divine and God is the husbandman. And so we're offshoots of this vine. Okay, John 15, 1, it says, I am the vine, this is Jesus, and the father is the husbandman. So, so God is like the, he's like the gardener and he's, he's pruning and he's taking care of this, of this uh, plant here, this vineyard. Number two, verse two, it says, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So the purpose of the Christian life is to be fruitful, biblically speaking, is to, is to produce spiritual fruit. And so what, what God does is uh, the, the fruit, the, the branches that aren't bringing fruit, he takes them away. But the branches that are fruitful, what he does is he, he purges it. That, that means that he's pruning it. He's cleaning it. He's making it more fruitful. Um, number, verse 3, it says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. That's how God does the pruning. That's how God cuts away at the flesh of our heart is through his word. That's how we become refined and purified. The word of God refines us. It cuts away the flesh, allowing us the opportunity to become fruitful. So if you want a plant to become fruitful, you just cut away all the excess of the plant and you channel all of the growing energy to one bud, to one stem. I think that's how it works. Spiritually speaking, what God wants to do is use his word to refine you, to make you more like him, which is in our next point. He, he wants to clean you and to get, get the, the fleshly desires out so that you can be, use all of your energy towards making, being fruitful, making disciples. And so the last thing, the last case that I want to make, I could make a ton of, a, you know, there's a ton of byproducts of the word of God in the, that, that we could find in the Bible, but this is just, just three of them that I wanted to share. The third reason that the word of God is important is it sanctifies us. You may ask, what, what is sanctification? That's a big word. Well, sanctification is, the, is just the process of being, becoming like Jesus. Okay. Biblically speaking, um, like God's desire for us is to be like his son, okay? And he, his son was uh, reaching the world. That was, that was the primary focus of Jesus was to, was to reach people with the message of salvation, that God wanted to redeem the people back to himself. And so that's what God wants to do in us is to make us like his son so that we can in turn reach other people. Um, I don't know about you, but that's not what I want to do with my life. I don't, I don't have any interest in that. What I want to do is, I just said it, what I want to do, right? So I need, I need God to change my heart and to make me like him. So he sanctifies us through his word. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We'll get to this in a minute um, it, whenever we look at the achiever, but I'm going to give you a little, a little precursor. What, it's funny because what we really want in life is what God wants for us. We just don't understand it yet. That's why he has to sanctify us. Because as we, as we catch vision of what God has for our life, man, at first it seems like the most unappealing thing in the world. But once you get vision of it and you begin to walk in it, it's the most fulfilling and purposeful life you can ever have. When God's word becomes the final authority in life, we are equipped with wisdom, with the wisdom and mind of Christ, giving us the certainty of the words of truth. We have something that we can stand upon. It is our final authority, and we can be certain in that. In the midst of a world that is full of uncertainties, a couple of weeks ago I said this, like, I don't even know if what I'm saying right now is acceptable today. Because, I mean, yesterday it was, but today it's probably not. I mean, if you're, if you, I feel for the, for the young ones growing up because everything that they're learning on a daily basis is changing. There's, there's no, there's no comp, like moral compass anymore. It's like this, you know, like we don't know what to believe. We don't, like we're walking on eggshells having conversations with people because we don't want to hurt their feelings and you know, well, we got to have a final authority. We have, we have true north. We can stand on God's word because it's true today. 
just like it was true thousands of years ago. So the stronger grip that you have on the word, the weaker our grip on the world will become. Okay, so if you, if you can identify with the fool, the only way that you're going to stop making foolish decisions, number one, is if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to cry out to the Lord for salvation. Number two, if you are a believer, you do know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, cling to the word of God. He will cleanse, he will cleanse you, sanctify you, and give you the right mind to, to make proper decisions. What's the result? The result here um, is that the fool cries out to the Lord in salvation, and he begins to praise the Lord. Verse, uh, Psalm 107, 21, it says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, and let them sacrifice the sacrifice of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. So they praise God for his goodness, and they share their story with thanksgiving and rejoicing. This is the theme of our, of our message last week and the theme of our message this week. The whole point is, man, when God delivers you from your foolishness, we tell it, we share it. Man, I used to be over here and, and I was stuck in a mud pit and I couldn't get out. I was, I was so entrenched in my sin. I was so entrenched in these foolish decisions, but you never guess what happened to me. God changed my circumstance. I met him and he's given me the, the ability to process things properly. You just share the truth with people because they, they saw who you used to be. A lot, a lot of people have seen who you used to be. And now when they see what God has done, man, we share that. We share the message. And so, again, I, like I've said, I can relate to the fool at times. And, and so here, here's some things that, uh, that we can, here's a recap of this little section here. If this describes you and you don't know Jesus, you need to meet him because he'll change your life. He'll give you the ability to stop making foolish decisions. If this describes you and you do know the Lord Jesus Christ, turn to the word of God for healing and deliverance. And if this describes who you used to be, share it. Share your story. Be thankful and give testimony of, of what God has done in and through your life. Man, I love telling people about how God saved me from my stupidity. No one can deny what, what God has done in my life. They can deny his word all they want. They can reject the gospel. They can reject the, the word of God, whatever. That's fine. I mean, I wish they wouldn't, but that's between them and God, right? But what they can't, they cannot reject is my story. They can't, they can't deny what has happened in my life. There's power in a testimony. That's why God has given you a story and you need to share it. Okay, so let's shift gears. Now we're going to talk about a completely different person. In verse, verse 23 through 32, we're going to look at this, this person who is what I would call an achiever. Okay, so let's read about this, this person. Verse 23, it says, They go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters. These see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth, sorry, and raiseth the storm, the stormy wind, which lifteth up the, heaven, uh, the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people, and praise him in the assembly of the elders. So, literally here, what we're talking about is a mariner, a, sea, a seafaring person, right? A navigator, someone that's out on the high seas. And so, in ancient times, as one could imagine, not a lot was known about the seas. It was just kind of like this, you know, I mean, your, your mind could wander at what's out there. 
it wasn't a common thing to have cruise ships and, you know, people, people weren't going out on a regular basis onto the high seas. And so these mariners, they were, they were um, looked at as daring and mysterious individuals. They were very, they were um, very well, I mean, high, high, like honored people. Um, and so the tales of the sea thrilled all of the hearts in awe. And, and those who returned home alive from a voyage, they were looked at as men of renown. Okay, so if you were going to be a mariner, if you were going to give your life to the sea, you, you were ambitious. You, you, were, you were giving your life for, for, this, uh, for this career path. And, and it was one that was, that was with great honor if you, if you made it. And so let's make some spiritual applications here. You've gotten the literal context, but let's make a spiritual application. So today we're going to look at this passage as someone who is an achiever. Okay, just as the mariner was, was a go-getter, this person is overly ambitious in life. They dream big and they stop at nothing, no matter the cost. And sometimes it costs them everything, just like a mariner. They may not return home. Success is the only option. And they have no time for eternal things because they're too busy chasing after temporary things. And so uh, I just want to make this caveat. There's nothing wrong with achievement. There's nothing wrong with, with working hard. I think if we had a little bit more uh, people in this world that were willing to work hard, we would be okay. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people with the wrong perspective. Okay, so, so when we're talking about achievement, I know biblically, we, we work hard. We, we want to be laboring as unto the Lord and not unto men, right? We, we, we want to make an impact wherever we go, and we should, be, we should be hungry to make an impact. But at the same time, we have the right perspective when going into this. Okay, we're talking about someone who has the wrong perspective here. Verse 20, let's read the problem with, with this achiever. Verse 23, it says, They go down to the sea in ships. They do business in great waters. These see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. So they're out there on the sea, and out of nowhere, a hurricane comes. And a, temp a tempest is, has arose, and they mount up to the heaven, and they go again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. And you could imagine what would happen if you're out on the, the high seas and you're in a, a rickety wooden, wooden ship. Man, and you, and you don't even, like, you think that the, that the deep is filled with demons. You have no idea what's going on. You're just, it's just, why did we do this? Why do we set sail? That's what's happening to these guys. They reel to and fro. They stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. So they're, they can't even keep their legs because the boat is just... It's, it's going crazy. And so they're, they've, they've reached their mental capacity to, to process it. They're going nuts. Their, undo, their undoing is their desire to succeed. This person is a workaholic. They're at the center of their own dreams. They throw themselves into their work with half-baked excuses. They always have an excuse as to why they're working more. They always have an excuse as to why they miss their children's soccer game. They always have an excuse as to why their passion project has, well, I just gotta, I've got to work a little bit harder and then I can take it to market. They've always got excuses and they're half-baked. They find purpose in a job or passion project, not realizing that in an instant their purpose in life could be taken from them. They don't, they don't realize that that job that they're working so hard for, they're working hard to make someone else some money, well, they could be replaced in an instant. They don't realize that that passion project could be, the rug could be pulled out from under you before it even takes off. They get so caught up in their career, caught up in pursuing their dream, chasing the bag. That's money for you non-Gen Zers, right? Uh, they don't even realize their life has turned into a hurricane. 
And so how does this manifest itself? How does this storm manifest itself in the life of, uh, of an achiever? Um, it, it manifests through marital troubles, through financial ruin, sometimes through physical ailment. You work yourself to death. You work yourself into a, you, you work yourself so hard that, that you become stressed. Anxiety takes over. Um, the walls of life begin to cave in on you. Man, when you, set, when you left port, everything was going swell. But in an instant, your whole life comes crashing down. This leads to physical and mental decay. The rug is swept out from under, under them, and they have nothing to stand on. They're stumbling about like they're drunk because they, they have, they have no, nothing to hold on to anymore because their life is like this, and there's nothing to grab on to. The surety of the ship has now turned them into a rag doll at the mercy of the storm. Okay, so, so here's, here's a story for you. Maybe this sounds familiar to some of you. You get the dream job. You're climbing the corporate ladder. You've got your white picket fence, and the Joneses are jealous, right? The Joneses are trying to keep up with you, right? Life is peachy until one day it all comes crashing down. Overnight, a global pandemic hits. The economy tanks. And your job is no longer deemed essential. In an instant, your purpose in life is gone. How are you going to pay your bills? How are you going to feed your family? What happens here is ultimately it leads, leads to mental instability. This is where people are today. This is where we're at as a society. Depression and suicide are at an all-time high. The statistic, according to studies, is roughly 130 people a day are taking their own lives. That's more people than are in this room right now, probably. Like, we need to have a per perspective shift, right? Our perspective needs to be on eternal things, not on temporary things. Because if you're investing in temporary things, it's going to only last temporarily, Then what? Okay, so the achiever has spent their entire life in pursuit of temporary joys, but when the storm hits, none of that really even matters anymore. You're just trying to stay alive. You're trying to stay afloat. You hit rock bottom and have no purpose. So what is the solution? Jesus puts it this way, Matthew 16, 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? A, that's, that's a question if I've ever heard one. What is it going to profit you if you have everything, but you lose your own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What, are you worth, what is your soul worth to you? Is it, is it worth keeping up with the Joneses? Is it worth losing your family because you're working so hard for them? What is your soul worth? What is your family worth? What is their soul worth? Are you willing to sacrifice yourself, uh, uh, yourself or your family on the altar of temporary achievement? We need to trade in the temporary for the eternal. Okay, so here's the solution. The only calm to the storm is saving faith in Jesus Christ. The only way you're going to get the right perspective is to, is to be saved. Look at verse 28, Psalm 107, 28. Then, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. They got to hit rock bottom. Sometimes we just have to hit the bottom. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. When you put your trust in Jesus, the storm fades away. He begins to give you an eternal, he gives you an eternal perspective the proper perspective to navigate life and you learn to trust in Jesus' achievements. Yours don't matter anymore. We, we, we trust in Jesus' achievements. We rest in that. We find rest 
and comfort in what he's done. Go to Matthew 6. Keep your place in Psalm 107. But Matthew 6. Jesus speaks a lot about perspective. He speaks a lot about, like he, because we're, we're, we live in the fleshly realm. And so it's really easy for us to get caught up in vain pursuits. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. We all get caught up in this. And if you don't, please enlighten me. Because I, I, think, I think that it's almost impossible to live in a, in a fleshly realm and not pursue fleshly things at times. But Jesus is always giving us insight into why this is dangerous. That's why Jesus is such a great teacher. Even if you, I mean, like just, this is such a profound passage. Matthew 6, 19, he gives us some really good wisdom. Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth where moth moth and dust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. That new boat that you want so bad, it's eventually going to rust. Or maybe, maybe you're the fool and you're driving too fast on the water and you sink it, you know, like you break it. I don't know. Like all these things, there's, again, I'm not trying to say there's, that you shouldn't have a boat. That's not, the, that's not the point. But when that becomes the point of your life to get the boat, to, get the, to pursue these, these things, that's when, that's when the plot is lost and you got to reconsider. Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What do you treasure? The things that you treasure, that's what your heart's after. We need, we need to position our hearts to treasure the eternal, not the temporary. And here's the irony of the whole ordeal. I, I made mention of this earlier. I referenced it earlier. Once we turn to the Lord, he gives us what we really wanted all along. Psalm 107, verse 30. I love this verse. I can, I can relate to this verse. Like when I was reading it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. It says, Then are they glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. You see, I have tendencies to be an achiever at times. When I was young, I, I was the most hungry individual in the world. I, I wanted more than anything to achieve my dreams. And, and I stopped at nothing. Um, I, put off my, I put off my life to pursue this, this dream, making no money. It was just a passion project of mine. And... When it was taken from me, I was still looking for, for a new dream, right? And then God brought us here. I'm just going to be honest. I was 22 when I moved here. There's not a lot, not a lot to offer a 22-year-old and his wife in Iola, Kansas, is there? I mean, we moved from a town of 100,000 people, right? I mean, not big, but... Huge compared to Iowa. We could do whatever we wanted. I thought that was small. <laughs> right? And, th- and then we moved here. Man, I, I didn't realize this was my desired haven. My dreams were just too small. I love that. Because who would have ever thought that this is where I wanted to be? Not me. I guarantee you... I, I wanted to move to Nashville, Tennessee and, and pursue a career in, in music. And I had, I had the connections and all the things lined up. But my dreams were just too small. You see, I was, I was at my wit's end, as the Bible puts it. I was going through serious depression because I, because I wasn't achieving what I wanted. And so I was trying to make it happen. I was willing to put my, my wife in jeopardy to take us to Nashville. And then God said, no, that's not, that's not what you want. This is what you really want. And I had to fight with him about it. I laughed at Tony when he told me that, God, that he felt like God was calling me and my wife here. I literally laughed at him. Like, that's hilarious. 
I'm not moving here. No offense, right? No offense to Iowans. I love, this is home. I just didn't know this is where I wanted to be. I didn't know this was my desired haven. When you yield yourself to the Lord, we trade in our temporary daydream for our genuine passion. He gives us our desired haven. Your, dream, your dreams were just too small. What you had planned for your life may seem ambitious and great, but, but your dreams are too small. The Lord wants to take you on a journey that is way bigger than you could ever imagine. Now, there's only one thing left to do. Verse 31. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. The achiever now becomes ambitious for reaching souls. We need achievers in the body because they become ambitious and hungry for the work of the Lord. They trade in their vain pursuits for the eternal work of making disciples exalt and praise the Lord. Share your story with anyone that will listen. And so again, let's recap the achiever. If you are an achiever and you don't know Jesus, don't wait until you are disoriented by the storms of life. You don't have to hit rock bottom. Today is the day for salvation. Turn to Jesus today. He's going to give you the peace and purpose that you long for. And if you are a believer and have tendencies to pursue vanities, set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. A saying I like to say is live life with eternity in view. Number three, if you describe, if this describes who you used to be, share your story. Share of how your dreams were too small. Tell of how God has brought you to your desired haven. Because it doesn't matter what your story is. It doesn't matter if you're a wanderer, a prisoner, a fool, or an achiever. It doesn't matter if you're all of those or, not, or, or just one of them. You, we all have a story to tell. And so when we share our testimony, like I already said, no one can deny the power of what God has done in our life. People will love to deny the authority of Scripture. They love to, to reject the gospel, but, but they cannot reject your story. They cannot reject what God has done in your life. The one thing they cannot deny is the power of God working in and through your life. And so that's our final charge is just share your story. Share your testimony. That's what we've been going through on Wednesday nights. We've been, we've been unpacking our, our uh, new evangelism. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what we call it. We just call it harvest teams. It's, it's, it's who we are as Christians, right? Where we, where we learn how to share the gospel with people. We learn how to, first we become their friend. And then we, we uh, eventually, um, we share our testimony with them. That's what we've been going over. And, and so I thought it was fitting that we were preaching this passage over the last few weeks. And so that's my charge to you. Your story is worth sharing. Don't be afraid of your past. Right? Your past is what God has given you your past so that you can share it. Because that's powerful. Right? Don't be ashamed of that. So let's pray. Um, and, then, uh, and then we'll be dismissed. Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning. God, um, man, I could relate. I, I'm the fool. I'm the achiever at times, God. I, I, I have tendencies to, to wander and to flounder any which way I can. But Lord, I'm so grateful um, for your salvation God, I'm so grateful that you have changed the trajectory of my life, and now I have a story to tell. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd give, give us opportunities to share our story. And God, I pray for those in here that don't know you as Lord and Savior. I pray that today would be this, the day of salvation, Lord. God, we lift up our pastor to you. I pray that you would speak uh, boldly through his sermon. God, we lift up the Brown family. Uh, as they're being sent off to Ireland. 
I pray that you would equip them with everything that they need to accomplish the task that you've given them. God, we love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.